Well, thanks for having us today. And uh, you had a lot of choices of what you could have uh, gone to see. And thank you for selecting us. As far as, boy, you got to put this right up to your mouth. As far as what to wear, I wasn't sure I should go corporate or if I should wear my, my hoodie. And truth be told, it's a little bit designer, so I didn't want to wear it. <laughs> but I do have my Doc Martens. So let's go back uh, about a decade ago. And I'm the chief of cyber operations for the organization that is about to replace the organization that is heading, uh, heading up the information infrastructure for all of Iraq. And our job is to go close down Iraq the first time, or maybe second time, or maybe third time. And as we're doing our final checks, we're doing a full-blown operation, an exercise that's connecting organizations all over the, the country with the organizations that are in country. And this is live fire. Things are really happening. All of a sudden, we get this notice from DISA, the Defense Information uh, security agency, and they call us and say, you have an issue. You never want that call. What's the issue? You have some computers that are beaconing. They're trying to phone home, and they're doing port scanning out, outside of your network. Um, the challenge we have with that is we're on a secure network. We're behind. We're, we're those red wires. Oh, boy, what, what's going on? We were also the number two priority for the U.S. Army as far as support. For all of DOD, for the Army, we were number two. Number one were the guys we were replacing in country. We had a red team. We all know what a red team is. We had a blue team, which means we had a lot of help, people helping us get our stuff together. We also had a green team which were advisors, experts in different systems to kind of coach us along. They couldn't figure out what it was, none of them. I shut the red team down because exercise over, this is real world now. We're at the largest installation uh, in, the U in the US government in Fort Bragg. We had special operations. We had a giant network there. It's one of the, the big hubs for the government. They have experts. We called on them. They didn't know. We didn't know. So we called the, the Army CERT. Back then, it was just really kicking off. And their response, and this is where you come in, their response was this. Send us the hard drives, and we'll let you know what's going on. In the meantime, we're in the middle of it. This is a two-week train-up, and it's going from one to two to four to 16 to 32 to where I have to go tell the general there's something wrong, and we may have to shut down the network. But I was the, number, I was a, the CISO equivalent, cyber operations. I had a CIO who was a rank higher than me. And I tell him, boss, this is going on. Here's the impact this may have. All of our systems are going to be infected at the rate that this is going. And we have thousands of computers here. We need to tell the boss what's going on, the general who makes the operational decisions. What do you think his response was? Anybody? I'm not telling him. You tell him. <laughs> Leadership 101. <laughs> so that goes back to what leaders need to know. Don't put your security people out there to, to hang. So I go and tell them. The general says, is that what we have to do? I'm the expert. Yes, that's what we have to do. We shut it down. We were down for several hours. We re-imaged. Uh, we don't fix. We re-imaged. We re-imaged everything, but we have the capacity to do that quickly. We have some awesome racks and that's how, how we fix things. But the moral to that story is, I sent up a red star cluster, and nobody came. 
There was no help. There were no experts around. So what I'm coming here today to share with you, to request from you, is you are the expert. You have a role. You have an important role. Please help us secure our systems from the inside out. Making sure security is embedded from the start. Because when it really matters, when lives mattered, we weren't getting help. There was nobody there. So that's where I'm coming from over a decade ago, just about. And I don't know that we moved that much uh, farther down the line. Chris? So I'm Chris Kubeka. Is it on? Yes. All right. And um, I, too, come from a military background. But I'll give you a story about after I uh, became a civilian and I actually had to involve uh, the military. Um, I can't say what year, but I can tell you it was my first nuclear incident. What had occurred was we had, like many organizations have, a central antivirus server. However, the company I was working for had a very, very, very high threat profile. And we had a lot of joint ventures that we connected to, and one of those happened to be uh, a joint venture with a nuclear facility, a nuclear power plant. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just getting over a cold. So uh, what had happened was, um, our central antivirus server at the time, it could take what is called a super DAT file from anywhere without authentication and rewrite the super DAT file. And unfortunately, a particular nation state had gotten a hold of their own central antivirus server from this particular vendor, even though they were sanctioned, and sent our systems one of these super DAT files to then use us as a pivot to that joint venture and to uh, affect very possibly a nuclear power plant. Now, when we saw what was happening and we went back to the vendor and we said, hey, we need a fix immediately, like right now, like a day ago, we need this immediately. Uh, it turns out that that particular antivirus vendor uh, did not have any mechanism to do any quick fixes. And on top of that, the vendor, because they did not have a process, also told us that we had to pay extra money for a support contract to move us up to a gold level to do so. And we tried to express the seriousness of the fact that in this super DAT file, uh, the attackers had uh, taken out certain potentially unwanted uh, file names and so forth so that the adversary could uh, go ahead and roll right through and use us as that pivot point. Now, even though this was a uh, civilian company and I was no longer in the military, because of the seriousness of the nature, I had to also contact DISA and some of my counterparts there with their security operations center leaders. And we had to come up with a plan around the vendor to try to ensure our employees' safety because this particular adversary also did uh, minor terrorist attacks when these things were occurring. Uh, we knew that the telecommunications infrastructure may be taken out uh, through uh, various types of malware and so forth in this country. Had to coordinate uh, possibly one of the largest satellite phone drops ever uh, to protect our employees and completely work around the vendor. Because the problem is uh, antivirus runs on your system as administrator. And unfortunately, even though it is a security product, how many of you think that it's actually thoroughly security tested? No hands went up. Yes. Um, and this is unfortunately something that occurs. Now, because the vendor did not have a mechanism to be able to update, look through their code, update things quickly, turn on certain features like, I don't know, authentication, uh, that also showed that their coding practices were perhaps not up to the standard that, say, OWASP would love everyone's coding to be up to standard. I doubted that they did unit testing, for example. I don't think that they even heard of clean code or anything in between. So here is where application developers, when you're developing something, even as a security product, can have large ramifications in the world as, uh, unfortunately, uh, various adversaries, whether they are sophisticated criminal gangs who are very well funded 
or uh, nation states that are utilizing a certain, uh, say, cybery talent to be able to affect anywhere in the world at any time. So with that, what are we going to do today? We're going to share a couple of war stories and kind of give you some uh, best business practices. What we're not going to do is we're not going to use FUD, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Because you hear that over and over and over. Instead, we want to inform you, inspire you, and empower you. And we're going to focus on things that you can do, some of the, again, frameworks, best business practices, as we go along here. So a while back at SCOTUS, uh, SANS, ICS, talked about uh, cyber criminals. And he said, if a cyber criminal isn't using, or if criminal isn't using cyber to commit crimes, he should be sued for malpractice. This is my spin on that. And by workshop, I mean one of Chris's workshops. <laughs> Yeah, um, last year I had the privilege of being on a high-level panel with uh, a minister from Estonia and a few others talking about energy transition and trying to employ people uh, moving from coal onwards. And one of the things I mentioned on the panel was the fact if we do not take care of people losing their jobs, uh, especially in certain areas like Eastern Europe, they are going to switch to cybercrime. And we have seen this time and time again. Uh, the average wages for a PhD uh, person in Bulgaria is 350 euros. The average wage for being a cyber criminal in Bulgaria is 10,000 euros a week. Which one would you choose, especially if you have a family? So we have to think about the fact that criminals are using and misusing our technology every single day for monetary gain. And we have to be aware of the fact that what we might be coding can be dual use and turned against us, and keep that in mind. So one of the problems that we have with uh, writing applications, uh, implementing uh, large, um, uh, well, rolling out applications is the fact that there's a lot of attack surfaces. You're using, for example, a lot of open source libraries, but how do you know that those open source libraries have not been tainted? Uh, how do you know if you update even those open source libraries when you do a, a update itself on your entire code that uh, someone has not adjusted something and left a back door into it? So uh, most companies, most organizations, pieces of hardware and so forth rely on a lot of open source code because it's there, it's cheap as in free for the most part if you follow the licensing. And this is one of the things that can add to the large attack surface. And that's only one part of the issue that we have. Uh, another one is when we think about things like uh, how many of you have an Alexa in your house? All right. How, how many of you are going to admit it? <laughs> <laughs> Right? We think about the uh, doorbells, we think about the other cameras, we think about the fact that home burglar alarm systems are now IoT systems in many cases. Uh, we've got a lot of this uh, IoT in our uh, homes. Think about your smart meters as well for your power. Uh, if anybody has a Tesla Powerwall, uh, those are web enabled. I have come up with a very interesting way to find all of them on the internet. He 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 he. Um, and so we're using a lot of open source libraries in these as well. Sometimes, many times, they don't actually have a very good mechanism for updating. So they are at a certain price point. Most of us don't go out to the store and say, I want to buy the most expensive thing. If you do, please take me shopping. Um, and the problem is, you might have a vendor making a product today, and they're out of business tomorrow. And so we have this very large attack surface as well with all of that. And a lot of these devices are using older Linux kernels or very, very old, very, very vulnerable open source libraries as well. And the problem is a lot of these devices are being used, for example, how many of you heard of the Mirai bot? Right? Uh, the last few days, I've been hearing word from one of my counterparts in Japan, CERT, about actually a more advanced version of the Mirai bot 
and uh, something that can have even more devastating effects, which they have been trying to uh, analyze and issue recommendations going forward. So when we code for technology, we also have to understand that that technology may eventually be used maliciously and want to kill us, or at least flood the internet with traffic or be used in a monetary value where, say, a bot herder then goes and resells the devices that are in your home or especially in your pocket because also uh, older Android phones and so forth that are not updated are also being used in these bot attacks. So the point up there is that you're the shield. You guys are the ones who are developing these apps. Anybody with, other than us two up here, with prior military experience, who's responsible for safety in your organization? What was that? Everybody. Who's responsible for security in your organization? What does the non-security person say? You are. So you're the shield. We're the shield. Collectively, all of us have this responsibility. And so again, we know the attack surface is growing, and it's growing in this space here that we're covering. So we have some actions that, that we should take into consideration and do something. So to the military reference, left of boom, my right, your left, right of boom, my left, your right. What does that mean? What is the boom? Anyone have any idea what the boom is in, a, in an incident? Okay, so I heard a uh, cyber incident, when it starts, uh, a mishap, when it's, when it's detected. Okay. <laughs> Everything you're talking about here is actually left of boom, my right, your left. The boom is when you lose control of the incident itself. We take this story from a vehicle driving down a road in, in a hostile environment, and the boom is when the IED goes off. You now go into reactionary mode. You're now responding to everything uh, that may or may not be happening because you have this concept of the fog of war. You're in the middle of it. You are not in control of that. But on the left of boom, my right, you have a lot of control. There's regulations on when you report the incident, but the idea is that you have control of that. What you do, what you don't do, how you practice, how you code your, your apps, how they're implemented, when you updated, you have a lot of control. Once the boom, and the boom here is when you lose control, usually when the, it breaks on social media, you are now reacting to things going on. Many of you are probably dealing with an incident at one point or another that hasn't quite gone boom, but once someone external calls you, it's a whole nother story. What's the presence of your organization on social media? What's your statement? What are you doing? What are you not doing? Are you empowering your customers? Are you helping them out? Or are you saying it, it's not me and, and you drop that? So we're gonna use this concept here as we go along. Left of boom, you, your organization, us, we're in control. The more you do on that side will mitigate the damage, the cost on the other side. So how do we do that? We talk about threat intelligence, Sung Tzu, know your enemy, know yourself. It, the idea behind that is how good are you? Where are your weak spots? Where are you accepting risk? Knowingly accepting risk, informed. What about the threats? Who is interested in you? I've had many people say nobody's interested in me. I, I'm, I'm a nobody. Uh, 
maybe, but that whole Kevin Bacon, six degrees of separation, that's a short time span. And it's usually about two degrees or three from someone in your ecosystem that really matters. So the question is, who is going to answer your email and click on a link from you that might have great impact? Probably all of you are a part of some, uh, say, kill chain where you can be reached. And so we talk about the different intelligence way, ways to gather intelligence. And one of the experts on open source intelligence is Chris. So uh, open source intelligence is data that uh, you can uh, collect where you're not, say, hacking into a system, but it's publicly available. Now, one of the problems with uh, the collection of data that a lot of applications do is it collects way too much. And many times that data becomes exposed either purposefully or inadvertently. And trying to control that information becomes very difficult once you have coded to collect things like, hmm, maybe I want the telemetry data from a system. How could that be used? Maybe I want to get all of the uh, XFIL uh, metadata from images using my application. How can that be misused? How about uh, a very interesting example, uh, Microsoft Office documents, uh, unless you very purposefully go in and try to clean that document before it's posted online, uh, will give away author information, sometimes printer information, internal IP information, email addresses, and so forth. That information can then be analyzed with a variety of different tools, and you can basically find an entire network layout from a whole bunch of uh, documents that have been placed up online that Google Google or other search engines will index. And one of the problems is, how can a naughty, naughty party or person misuse that information? So one of the things to consider is, how much data is your application collecting? And how can that data be misused? So that's the, the open source. You then have the all source intelligence, which means I'm going to use everything I can every source, every resource to find out information about you. There's signal intelligence. Who's connected to the Wi-Fi here? Okay, I won't ask, don't show me hands who VPN, who took measures to secure your connection, but we know that people don't. And you have to do an extra step to secure it. Are you embedding those steps as a user experience automatically, where by default they go secure? Or are you doing the opposite, where you just want to collect the information because you have no responsibility for that data? They're human. It means I'm going to focus on you and find out as much about you as I can. Uh, not by technology, but just by getting to know you. Very easy to do. For those of you who are great developers and are in high demand on working on things that are very important to your company, I would tell you if you worked for me, you are, this, I see a few of you, this won't apply to you because you are this person. You are not that good looking and you are not that funny. So when you're at the bar and you're the funniest person there and, and you're that good looking, Someone is social engineering you. But again, there's a couple of you, you probably are that funny and you probably are that good looking. But know that people are trying to collect information from you. And then there's imagery information and there's other kinds of information of, of different the ints. And if I'm trying to target you, think like the adversary. I'm gonna see how can I get the information that I need from you? And the unfortunate thing, the state we're in now, is we're giving it away for free. We're giving and we're collecting that information. So my daughter, when she was a child, was a big Toontown fan. Anyone know what Toontown? Anybody heard of it? Okay, so Disney stopped supporting it. And a bunch of folks in the open source community decided, we're gonna bring it back because we used to play this as a kid, and so now it's one of those throwback games that you get to play that you should play when you were younger. 
So she got a new computer. She updated the operating system with security measures that will tell you when you have an app, what is going on. <clears throat> My daughter's not a security person. She's an animal science person. <clears throat> but she grew up with me, so she's security. She says, Dad, check this out. The game will not work with the latest update to the computer. Toontown, why won't it work? It says I have to enable, you know, by default it was secure in this case, I have to enable these permissions. I'm not doing it. What permissions are those? Keystroke loggers. <laughs> and it explains, well, for your experience, so we can know how you're using it and to improve your experience, we're going to log your keystrokes. It's a game. How many apps do you guys write where by default you get access to a lot of the information that is on a device? Now, what do you do? Like many of you, I have my devices segmented. So I have stuff protected behind one uh, partition and the other. But the idea is that I know that, and my company provides that for me. That's not the ecosystem we live in. I know that. And if I was an adversary, I'm going to exploit that environment. I'm going to find out how you use it. I already know a few of you people connected to the Wi-Fi. I don't have to explain the man in the middle tech. You guys know how that works. But I did too. I did too, because I had to get the slides up here. But I immediately went to my VPN and connected, and I used a different you know, throwaway email to transfer data behind systems. And I, I took a whole bunch of extra steps. You probably did that too. Yes, you did. Those of you connected, I know you did. But what about the average user? That's what we have to contend with. What are the people who are going to be the targets? What are, how are they using it? Chris talked about the features that you guys provide in, in your apps. They're awesome. But they're also used for nefarious things. So it's not about creating a safe environment alone. It's about creating an informed environment. So as you're using these systems, these features that you include, that you really know what exactly you're opening up your users to. And you make a conscious decision that our business model is to do this or it's not, and accept the responsibility for it. So the boom, we talked about the vulnerabilities. Okay, I want to find out what, vulner what are you not doing or what are you doing that is enabling me? How many people do you know click, 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 click and don't even read any of that stuff? And if, even if you did read it, who's read a, a EULA in the last week? Oh, I saw a couple of hands. I, I, I <laughs> did, I did. Uh, and I still clicked because to use that product, I had to give it permission. So take into account how people are using your information. Do you want to comment on that at all? Yes. Uh, one of the problems uh, with the human factor is, again, your average user isn't going to know about a lot of these different things. Um, also, at the same time, there are still applications that are being developed and used actively that, uh, unfortunately, um, try to make things very, very easy for the user but still have major problems. I was uh, given a uh, bit of insight on Swiss Air, for example, uh, Yesterday morning, one of my friends, he lives in Switzerland, and he was having problems with the security features or lack thereof of the uh, uh, web application, both on the web and on his phone. Because it turns out, and this one still doesn't make any sense to me, um, he could put special characters in his password to access his account on the internet, uh, but he could not use a special character in his password to access the application on his phone from Swiss Air. Does that make any sense? No, no. Um, so uh, unfortunately, uh, one of the problems is that uh, some criminals like to get air miles and steal them away, buy airplane tickets, or sell them off, or so forth. 
And we have this great functionality of an app on your phone if you're a frequent flyer with various things, but we don't think about the fact that being able to say maybe the issue is escaping special characters. Who knows? Maybe that's why they cannot allow uh, the special characters and a password. But we have to take into account that human factor where they're going to try to do things as easy as possible. And one of the things we have to do is make security for them as easy as possible by doing secure by design. What about how do you exploit a system that works perfectly, but you're actually taking advantage of its own way of, of operating. So the next one here is, I think will lead to that. Uh, tell us about that. What happened there? Yeah, so this was a uh, <laughs> an automobile in the United Kingdom. Uh, the guy obviously was an application and uh, database developer. And uh, he actually used this for various uh, speed cameras in the United Kingdom and actually caused uh, some drop tables. Uh, <laughs> And here was, you know, basically a camera system hooked up to a database, and they never thought that someone d would do this, but they had never actually tested it for SQL injection and how things would be carried over. So you think that something is there for safety. For example, you don't want a bunch of people speeding, hitting children, whatever it may be. But if you don't security test these things, then this can absolutely happen. Uh, I think he uh, ended up getting his uh, points on his license as a uh, penalty, if I remember correctly. Um, but uh, yeah, this can be very, very problematic. So um, these are some of the things you have to think of. Another thing to consider is uh, one of my favorite attack techniques that I like to uh, teach uh, people is taking... Um, very vanilla looking applications that are written for, say, I don't know, uh, looking for your printers from, say, Brother. And unfortunately, because it was not thought of of dual use and not very secure by design, um, I can use the uh, Brother uh, software to access any publicly available printer and upload files through that without authentication. Anyone think that's a great idea? Yay! But can you print for free in the hotel? <laughs> yes! Yes, I can. So it, it, the idea is that we say, uh, again, in, in my experience in the military, Joe, G.I. Joe, the soldier, is going to find a way to circumvent the security or whatever you make it hard. If you make it hard, they're going to find a way around it. Even if you make it hard, there's some very bright people out there who are still going to find a way. So you have to take this into account. So you find the vulnerabilities. Now what? What, what do you do? You find a way to address these things in a systematic, methodical way. Anyone know where the, that slide come from, what, what that is, the steps? CMMI, yep, CMMI, Carnegie Mellon, maturity model. So you, there are tools out there to help you, but you can't just sit there and say, well, I'm going to use these things. It has to be for an end state, a purpose. So if you don't mind covering the top one there. Yeah, so uh, one of the problems is uh, many times you will have an application where it is not coded in a manner that you can roll out a very quick update. It might not be very modular, for example, or you might not have a process in place to be able to do that uh, if you need to do that as quickly as possible because of a very, very severe exploitable vulnerability that you then have to code in. And of course, hopefully then test the code before you send it out to your customers because some Sometimes we have also seen that the fixes that are put out and rolled out actually um, are worse than what was there before. And so we have to be aware of that. And so other best business practices that we use is we all know about the NIST cybersecurity model, but there's another one called Mission Command. Mission Command is a framework of how you would respond as an organization to an incident or crisis. And there's multiple steps to that. One of them is you gotta build your cohesive team. You talk about the hiring that's going on out here, the discussion on that. 
but who else is on your team? I consider you a member of my tribe. Like it or not, I'm a member of your tribe. We are in this together. There are probably some relationships that are gonna develop that in the future, you're gonna depend on them. When you have a crisis, that boom, that is not the moment to be exchanging business cards. You do that in advance. You prepare for the crisis. You prepare for your cyber worst day like a team prepares for the Super Bowl. The alternative is a pickup game on the playground. Whoever happens to be there is who you got. Do you have someone on retainer? Do you have expertise on your bench that you could reach out to that you can't afford 24-7, 365, but you could afford them for this incident now? Do you have that team on the bench? Are they identified in advance? I deal with crisis response. Been doing it for a long time and I do it now with uh, my company. There's a chance that if there's an incident going on you will call for help, and no one is gonna be available to help you. Because there's people who were paid in advance, or they're coordinated in advance to help them. This is not unusual. Several years back, <clears throat> we had a discussion, and we talked about red lines and what to expect from your crisis responders. We had DHS, we had uh, NSA, Cybercom, we had FBI, and then we had a few lawyers, and we talked about what should you expect from a crisis response as far as help right now if something happens. And it was that response I got where, hey, I really need help. Send us your hard drives, and we'll get to it, and we'll send it back to you. Little to no help. So the idea is as you're exploring this process, of how you're gonna deal with these things, think of your ecosystem and who you have to connect with in advance. Now, Chris, you've connected with a few people on crisis management. Yeah, quite a, quite, quite a few people uh, on occasion, uh, as required. And um, this is one of the things I like about coming to conferences was the fact that uh, I can uh, meet people who I can call up uh, when there is a crisis, and I know exactly whom to call. Uh, people I've been working with since this morning, I happened to meet at a um, conference in Luxembourg, and the team I'm working with is uh, in Japan, dealing with something that's been occurring since this morning, as soon as I woke up at 5.30 in the morning. Uh, the person I contacted at DISA about my first nuclear event, I met at a conference in uh, Germany and got to know uh, that particular person and form a relationship. Um, and being able to know who to contact if you don't have those internal resources are very, very important. Now, when uh, Saudi Ramco was first attacked in 2012 with the Shamoon malware, one of the problems is uh, they had no one to call because they had no real incident management at the company at the time, and they were scrambling all over the place. Uh, shortly uh, after that, and when I began working for them and, then, and with them, um, it was very interesting since it was an oil company, and it uh, usually makes a lot of money, uh, employees expect a very nice bonus every year. So uh, my first few weeks in the office, I was reminded by many employees uh, in varying roles, we didn't get our bonus because of the attack. Are you going to make sure I get my bonus this year? <laughs> right? So it also goes down to a monetary value of, are you going to be able to get a bonus if something majorly happens with your organization because of that boom? Or will it put you out of business? So we also have to think about that as well. One of the things from listening to one of your broadcasts that I took from that experience, they asked, the, the interviewer asked you, why did they pick you to respond to that crisis? And I don't know if you remember your response, but it has to do with the, the, the partnerships and the engagement. Do you, remember what, do you remember what you said? 
basically, I have got a very wide-ranging network uh, internationally, and I have the ability to uh, hire and bring in teams very, very rapidly. And it was quite surprising to me that uh, the Saudi Arabian National Oil Company would ask me, uh, out of the blue, to help set up digital security moving forward and help to restore international business operations. So in times of a crisis, um, it should also be remembered that businesses will go for the best people possible. And uh, luckily, they happen to go beyond, say, any gender boundaries and uh, contact me. And so she has a lot of friends. You have a lot of friends. But you have to practice that relationship building. You have to, in time of crisis, already know what capability and capacity they're going to bring to the table. We use a mantra, train like you fight, fight like you train. Because how you test your group, how you're tested in the uh, most difficult times will reflect how you will react. And the people that you think are going to be there for you, you want to know that they're going to be there for you. And if you have a gap in your security or a gap in your response, you want to identify that during the practice, not during the incident. By that time, you're uh, at, at the mercy of the boom. You're now reacting. You're probably paying a lot more than you than you would have otherwise. So we're talking to you. You matter in this space. You're part of our team. You're part of our ecosystem. You're the ones who are influencing this landscape. We need your help. You need to, as, as we talk about security, you got to do security as if you're baking something where security is a main ingredient. It is not a condiment that you sprinkle on top. It is from the inside out. And unfortunately, if that does not occur, then uh, what happens is a lot of time and effort is wasted uh, trying to make up for those deficiencies. And that's the last thing you want in the middle of a crisis. The, the operational impact that you can have on an organization, on an individual, is significant. Because we know that the, the good threat actors are not hitting the strongest part of a, the security infrastructure of an organization. That's like saying there's a flagpole, you know, big steel pipe in the middle of, of your front yard with you know, 80 pounds of concrete embedded and it's going straight up. The threat isn't coming trying to go through the flagpole and just hitting their head on there. They're not even going around to your back door. If they want to get to you, to your home, using that analogy, they probably just have to go to your car that you left open, hit the remote control, and walk right in through your garage or your front door. We're making it too easy and where it has a, a negative operational impact. So you are the ones who can influence that. You are the leaders in this space. We're among giants here. What is your role? What are you going to do next to secure this space? So we left some time for questions and answers and to make sure we don't overrun. So please ask away. We want you to be part of our network and our friends as well. From the outline of the, uh, of the abstract, uh, from, the cyber tr from the war trenches to the cyber trenches, be prepared for that cyber worst day and practice, practice, practice throughout your organization how the cyber team or the CISO or the techs respond, that's not enough. It's a whole of business response. When we talk about crisis, uh, crisis response, if it's a tsunami coming here or an earthquake here, you know, we're in LA, I grew up here, we're not 
we don't go to the earthquake guy and say, what are we going to do? We go to the organization, both the mayor, both the other uh, critical infrastructure owners. How are we going to do this together? How are we going to respond? How are we going to test those relationships? Uh, my organization does this with New York City. We do it quite a bit. And we bring in different, both public and private sectors, so they can practice these relationships. And one of the things we try to change is the culture of security does not, is not owned by the IT people. It's owned by every single one of us, and that's what you reward. <laughs> in the back there, they had a question. Okay. Uh, to follow up on one of the points you said about, oh, the brother, you can just print to any printer. And in general, when presenting this threat to people, they're like, oh, so I waste a couple of pages of ink. I don't care. Reminding them that as an attacker, okay, great, you have a good, you, you have to have that deep bench of knowledge because I'm going to be able to take out your CISO and all of his top staff because I can find them on LinkedIn and print kitty porn and then report them to the FBI just during my event. So all of them are going to be under investigation, not allowed at work. See, now you're thinking like an adversary. How do I take advantage of this situation? And as part of your exercise in your practice, we usually go with two different plans or two different scenarios. What's the most likely thing to happen? And what's the most audacious thing the threat can do? Bad guys love LDAP-enabled printers. Too. Right. As you walk back there, there was actually a case where a nuclear power plant had to be shut down because one of the operators were suspected of downloading child pornography. And so the authorities went in and had to shut everything down to secure any evidence. That was a great question. So my question is along the same lines. Is I've noticed when I talk to people, I, I SOC and stuff like this, everybody thinks of cybersecurity as IT security. But it seems what I see today is that people are being hacked. Now, how do you deal with that? I'll use an example. There's an investment fellow that got up on stage recently, and he said something about getting in other people's pants. And you know that someone did a little neuro-linguistic programming on him before he got on that stage, and it cost him hundreds of millions of dollars. And so that is a new cyber threat, but how, how do you address that with the rest of the cyber community? Well, this is one of the things that preparing for various scenarios comes in handy. Because uh, once you start getting into that mindset that you know that something will occur, you can then change up the scenarios as those new threats come down the line. And then you already have that culture and mentality of preparation. And how do you implement that? How do you implement that? How do you sell that? So I'm going to give you an example here of a a security vendor who is a, a colleague of mine was trying to encourage his employees. This is a security company, a big one. You would know it if I mentioned it. Uh, but how does he encourage his employees to be more secure? And what he was doing was watching the people piggyback through the, the man traps as they're coming in. So basic Security, access control. How, how do you do that? They came up with several courses of action that cost a lot of money on education, on how to inform that. And he says, I got this. And he was the CEO and president, and he followed, the, he had the co-founder, he had someone video it on a smartphone, had the co-founder follow him piggyback into the, their facility. He then turned around and tackled him and told the security team, hey, this guy should have badged in. <clears throat> that went viral among the company. And it was the culture from the top all the way down that the threat will find a way. Don't make it easy for them. Well, how do you sell the C-suite on the idea that people will well, you know, take the role of an attacker, which is how I like to think. What would I do to manipulate a company to do what I want? And that's more than just cyber. Cyber is only a tiny piece of that. How do you 
sell that to the board that this is important? Real world examples, this has already happened before and on numerous occasions. And if they're not thinking about the fact that they can very quickly lose their business within a week's time, then they're not thinking about the risks that already exist and the risks that could actively target them. Think of competitors, for example, that would like to take them out. Think of the credit reporting agency, where they're at right now. I think yesterday was the deadline to file your uh, claim against them. Uh, as they reported, you know, potentially one major incident away from not existing anymore. Do you think that's going to get their attention? But the idea isn't about how cyber is going to hurt you. What are your pain points? And using all those sources of intelligence, how can I reach out and touch you? And in this space here, the reach can come from around the globe. It used to be you had to have geography. You had to share the same space with somebody to reach out and touch them. You don't have to do that. You want to hurt someone's credibility? I think like our, our partner here said, now you're a partner, even though he's on the phone there. You're one of our partners now. <laughs> tribe member. Tribe member. <laughs> member of the tribe. He said, I'm going to send something that you printed out that has child pornography or something that is totally unacceptable socially. You can say all you want, uh, I was hacked, I did these things here, but for a split second, someone may look at you differently and that may be all they need. Right. So it only has to be effective for the amount of time that I need it to be effective. <clears throat> Well, we're, we're at the top of the hour, but I'll, I'll quickly cover it. So you, you, we all know what a red team is. The red team is the ones who come in and do a penetration testing by not just cyber. It's any, any means necessary. How do you counter that? So we use, in, in the government, we use a blue team. This is, how, this is how we think the threat is going to behave, not limited to cyber. The idea is, how do we protect our trash cans from people dumpster diving? How do we be protect people from the gate guards? Here's a quick story, real quick. I know we're out of time, but we had government-issued phones in a top-secret environment, top-secret environment, and they said, because it's a government-issued phone and it had a little warning on there, this is a government-issued phone and we can do all these different things with the phone, it must be secure. It was just a screensaver. And they thought that this was something that was going to protect them in a classified environment. And that was before it was publicly known, all the things you can do with phones. But these guys were bringing it into a highly classified environment and using them. And when I got asked to give my opinion on it, I didn't. What I did is I told the general, this is how I would use a phone. This is what I would do with it. I can automatically get it to start. I could turn on the camera, I could do all these different things, and I may not be able to do that, but I got friends who can. <laughs> and I can probably hire people who can. And this is how I would use it. And the general said, okay, I'm gonna observe for a week, and then I'll make a decision on this policy, because my boss, the one who threw me under the bus, said, I'm not gonna tell all my peers they can't have phones in the operation, because we all have phones. He said his top security guy in the organization, not IT, the security guy, had his phone on vibrate on the top secret computer in the most classified spot because he didn't want it to ring and interfere with the briefs, but it vibrates so he can see it, so he can take the calls. His top security guy. I didn't have any issue convincing the general at that time to not allow mobile devices inside the operation. I made it come to life for him. He understood security, he understood risk, he just didn't understand 
this risk from these devices, from this environment. I didn't teach him something new. I just made it come to life for him. Well, thank you very much. We have to wrap up. It has been a pleasure. Um, we'll be around for the rest of the conference for additional questions. And